Hey, how's it going?
Thank <laughs> you. 
open to uh, the service. Let's go ahead and begin the service with a word of prayer and let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we uh, thank you. We come to you and we thank you for these people that have come uh, to church on a Saturday, Lord, that we be part of this conference and for all the salvations that we've had. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, continue to bless, bless the preachers today. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to page number 24. We're going to say, man, can it be that I should think? Page number 24. We'll sing it out from the first. And can it be? Sing it out. And I got married in March of 2015, 
And it's different being a single guy versus being married and having a family. When you have a family, you realize I need to be a part of a great church, something where I can raise my family in. And I decided I needed to make the move. I feel fortunate that I consider all the pastors in our new IFP movement, I consider them all personal friends of mine. So I talked, I visited all the churches and I talked to them and I told them that I had a plan of moving somewhere and I wanted to be trained to be a pastor. And what I decided the best fit for me and my family was here at Barry Baptist Church. Pastor Anderson made jokes just a few minutes ago about how all the people with Asian wives, this is the best fit for them. You know, at Barry Baptist Church, all the Asian wives seem to come here. So, But uh, we decided to move here to Barry Baptist Church. And I, I've been friends with Pastor Roger Menace for a uh, very long time, probably about eight or nine years. And up front I told him, you know, what my plans were. And he was very upfront with me. And he talked to me about what would be expected of me, what sort of time frame I could think of, what I would need to accomplish to prove myself ready. Because we strongly believe in our movement that we need to be ordained to be a pastor. Amen. And we need that training. And I did not feel that I was ready. I don't feel like I'm ready now to do that great work for God. And I'd rather wait and actually be ready than try to jump too early. Right. And so I, he was very upfront with what I would need to do. And there was other men as well. Brother Joel Usher, who gave a testimony last night, had just moved here a few months before that. And he also wants to be a pastor one day. And we just started that class. And there was a few other people who also wanted to be pastors. And we've had a lot of very practical lessons that have been really helpful in terms of training to be a pastor. You know, one of the things that we talked about up from the first lesson is what would be expected of us, which is very important for us to know up front what exactly he wanted us to do, what we had to achieve. And it's good to set a sort of goal because it kind of forces you to raise your level to what it needs to be at. And he also talked, talked to us about things like song leading and showed us how to lead songs. Those aren't things that you're going to cover in an actual sermon. But if you want to be a pastor, these are things that you need to figure out how to do. So he gave us a lot of practical lessons. He talked to us about writing sermons, the different styles of sermons, how to guest preach. And these are things that are very important for us to realize and learn how to do. So this class has been very helpful to me, and we're about probably a third to a halfway through the class. There's a lot more lessons to learn. You know, the way most IFP churches work is they send everybody off to a Bible college where they're supposed to get trained. And you can see those people, they go off to IFP the, uh, Bible colleges. They, they don't preach bad when they go, but they come back and they're extremely watered down. Yeah, the right. system doesn't work. You can look at the results, and it's, it, it doesn't work at all. Yeah, We're right, seeing right. a bunch of people start churches that are watered down. They yeah. don't know how to go soul winning. They don't yeah. preach hard. Right. And just the whole system is completely messed up. It doesn't work. You know, if, you're gonna do, if you want to be a pastor here one day, if you want to do something great, you need to make that decision to move and get trained. If you want to start a church like Verity Baptist Church, you need to be trained by a church like Verity Baptist Church. Right. If you want to start a church like Faith or Word Baptist Church or Word of Truth or one of these other churches, you need to be trained by a like-minded church. Otherwise, yep. it's not going to happen. Right. Now, I'm very thankful that we do have some pastors who really did set the groundwork for us. But, you know, I would rather learn these lessons before I become a pastor than have to figure out all, all this stuff when I actually am a pastor. Right. So I'd just like to encourage you to, to make that decision to move and to really try to get trained to be a pastor, not just one day just decide to be a pastor and not be ready for it. We need that training. All right, thank you. Thank you. young men here are interested in the ministry and you want to be preachers and you you need to be trained. You, you need to be willing to go somewhere. We, we mock these, you know, weak IFVs because they don't take a stand and they don't preach anything hard. Yet, their guys are willing to pack up and move to the Bible college and uh, we sit there and write about not having churches near us. You want know, to be a pastor, hey, make the sacrifice. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not, you know, if you need a church, you move to Philadelphia. Okay, guys, you want to be pastors, and you can't figure out how to move because of your job, you're not going to make it in ministry. All right? If you're trying to get into ministry and preach for a leader, you're not going to make a lot of money. I'll tell you that right now. So, uh, you know, make sure you get trained. And, uh, if you need a wife, we're trying to hook you up with someone from Asia. And, uh, <laughs> and here. All right? Uh, all right. Well, let's take our, our goals in there. The, the verse this week, as you have your day, Cry aloud, swear not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, the house of Jacob their sins. 
And uh, we're, we're well into the conference. We're glad that you've been with us. We, are, we have a couple of other great rooms available for the ladies, a dining room in the back for the men. All of the rooms have comfortable seating and monitor set up so you can still watch the service and listen to it. So if you have a child who's being distracted during the service, or if you need uh, some privacy, we encourage you to get up and walk back there. I want all these kids to listen up right now. Look at me, guys. Hey, every one of you, I want your eyes up here. Look at me. While the preaching's going on, you need to have your eyeballs on the preacher. Do you understand that? Yeah, yeah. No, we're not talking. We're not playing cards. We're not bringing off the Monopoly game, all right? We're, we're going we're gonna to pay attention. You're going to listen to preaching, okay? You're not up here just because you're cute. You, know, you guys are cute, but you're not up here for that, all right? You're up here because we want you to listen to the preaching. Conference schedule, after the service, at 5 p.m., we got the youth activity. If you're part of the youth activity, meet in the break room. If you're part of the singles activity, meet in the foyer. I didn't meet with the Washington people. I apologize. I, I just wasn't able to, but we'll meet after the service, uh, after this service, all right? And I need to talk to you guys. Uh, tomorrow, if you are staying... Uh, for Sunday, I appreciate that because I preach, but if you're staying till Sunday, uh, just want you to know we have coffee and donuts in the break room from 10 a.m. to 10.30. You're welcome to show up a little early, grab a grab a drink, and we have, you know, fruits and things like that, different types of pastries, and we're and we're double, doubling up what we normally have, so we, we have stuff for you tomorrow, coffee, coffee and donuts, 10 a.m. The service begins at 10.30. I'll be preaching the Sunday morning service. We will have a soul winning time at 2.30. If anyone's interested in going on Sunday, you can do that. If you want to rest uh, in the afternoon, that's fine too. Don't feel like you have to go. We, we had 195 soul winners this morning. Yeah, yeah. We had soul winning since Wednesday every day, sometimes multiple times a day. So you, you've done well. Right? If you need to rest, you take that time to rest. But some of you, you know, die hard, you, you want to go on Sunday, we'll have a group going on at 2.30. And then in the evening service, 6 p.m., uh, we're going to have guys preach from our church and the conference. And I, we, many of you have signed up, but if you've not yet signed up, if you're a guy who wants to preach a five-minute sermon, make sure you take your communication card, sign on the back that you want to preach, and put it in the offering place, and we put your name in the back. You're going to have... Right about five minutes to preach, so we have a lot of guys, and we're probably not going to get to all of you, all right? So we're just going to put your names in the bag, and we're going to pray that the Holy Ghost will direct it, all right? And we'll just pull out your name, and if you're chosen, then, uh, then you get to preach, all right? But if you want to preach, uh, make sure you fill that out, and uh, let's see. The, the last thing I want to bring up is the resource table uh, in the back. We've got... Pastor Anderson brought a lot of different resources for people work. We've got resources back there. Look, we don't want any of it, all right? We want you to take it. So don't just, if you if you, if you think like, oh, this would be good for someone I know, take one, two, three, as many as you want. If you're going to give them out, if you're going to give them away, take all of it and, and just get this stuff out there and spread uh, these resources. So take as much as you want and, uh, and, and please just... Give it to someone, give it out, make good use of it. If you can, if you can find a good home, uh, we would appreciate that. So just, you know, just, just go back there. If you haven't gone there already, take CDs, take DVDs, take whatever, uh, and, and that would be good. If you are getting baptized, uh, we have we have like six baptisms lined up or something after the service today, and we've got several baptisms tomorrow. If you're getting baptized, when Pastor Burson is done preaching, when he says amen, but I will come up here to lead a, a final song. You just get up and head towards, we'll have different ushers and uh, different people uh, guiding you. If you head to the restrooms, you change for baptism, and we'll baptize you right after the service. Those of you that aren't getting baptized, sit, sit tight, and we'll go through all the baptisms. And uh, let's see, I think those are all of the announcements I have for now. We're going to go ahead and take a moment. We're going to sing a song before we receive the offering. And I want to remind you that anything you give in the offering this week is going towards the love offerings for the preachers and also their expenses. And uh, we're going to go ahead and sing Hold the Fort, page number 411. 411, Hold the Fort. And uh, we'll sing it out on, on the first here. Sing it out. Oh, my God, I see the Savior.
time. And after the offering, we have uh, Pastor Logan Robertson from New Zealand, who's going to be preaching a 10-minute sermon. And then Pastor Burgess will be preaching out to him. Let's bow our heads and have a prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this group, Lord, and we thank you for what this group represents. Not just here in Sacramento, Lord, but all, all over this country and even in other places in this world. There are people that love you, that love your word, and that love to see soul saved. Lord, I pray you help us to be able to do great works for you. We pray that you bless the offering, bless those who give to support this ministry, this conference, and your precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Myself. My name is Pastor Logan Robertson. I'm from New Zealand. I'm not speaking in tongues, right? It's just, it's just my accent, right? You need an interpreter. But um, I was ordained about almost two years ago to start our church from a, a Baptist pastor ordained me, and we're nearly two years into it, and we're running about 25 on Sunday mornings. But um, we'll just read these verses. We'll start with you. We'll start at Hebrews chapter number one. We'll just read one verse from there, verse number eight. The Bible reads, but I'm, oh, verse nine, sorry. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, have anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now have a look at Ephesians. Keep your finger there, but go to Ephesians chapter number five. Have a look at verse number 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Heavenly Father, Lord, please fill me with the Spirit today. And um, I know I'm not an eloquent speaker, Lord, or no, you're not a great man, but Lord, please um, help everyone to have ears and ears, Lord, and to your son of prayer. Amen. Now, the title of my sermon is found in verse number 18, where it says, Be not filled, oh, be filled with the Spirit. So the Bible says here, then we need to be filled with the Spirit. Now, it says, in verse, oh, sorry. It says, and be not drunk with wine, where it exists, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, we need to be filled with the Spirit if we want to be, you know, great soul winners, if we want to live a great, you know, Christian life. And we need to be filled with the Spirit. Now, the Bible here says not to be drunk with wine, you know, because that's the opposite. You know, if you're going to, 
be drunk with wine, you're, you're not going to be filled with the Spirit. And, you know, my brother Garrett preached about wine. You know, there's two different wines in the Bible. You know, one's a, you know, just a grape juice. One's an alcoholic wine. And here, you know, if we can't be drunk with wine if we want to be filled with the Spirit. And, you know, there's, there's preachers out there that, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll condone, you know, drinking alcohol. You know, they'll say, you know, it's fine to drink a little bit of alcohol. It's fine to, you know, just have a wine with your dinner. You know, most men, you know, they're just idiots because they, you know, they want to, you know, they want to drink a wine. Yeah. But, you know, there's, there's like 10% of them. You know, there's a little other part of these um, people that say they drink and the alcohol is right. You know, and, uh, you know, they're actually perverts. You know, because the Bible says that, you know, there's, there's people out there, there's men out there that want to give you a bottle of wine. You know, they want to give your neighbor a drink yep. so that they can right. look on their nakedness. There's a guy, I don't know, you probably never heard of him. Was it No Covenant Baptist or something? No. <laughs> but if you don't know what I'm talking about, you know, don't even worry. You know, because you, you have to wash your eardrums out here. <laughs> you know, like soap, acid, you know, everything. Just to clean your ears. But this guy, you know, he'll say, you know, that, what does he say? Someone told me that, you know, you know the verse that says um, in Proverbs, not to even look at the wine? You know, when it moved with itself about, you know, and they'll say, you know, when you've had enough alcohol, you know, when the actual cup's like moving around, and it's like, <laughs> you know, you're pretty drunk, man. You know, you're drunk. You know, if, if, if that's how you are, you know, you're moving around, you know, you're drunk. You know, you're not going to be able to stop. You'll keep drinking and drinking and drinking because you, you can't understand, you know, and that, you know, these guys anyway, you know, and they, they fit into the category of improvements, you know, because both of them, you know, they, they look like queers, they sound like queers, you know, because they are. You know, they are fans. You know, they are. Both, I believe both of them are fans. I don't care, you know, well, you know, you should, I don't think you should say that. Well, I don't ask you your opinion. You know, I don't give a flip. Now, have a look. Ephesians, chapter number five, it says, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, we need to be filled with the Spirit if we want to be great soldiers, if we want to preach sermons. Now, and we, you know, even, you know, just to be a good husband, be a good wife, be good children, you know, we need to be filled with the Spirit. You know, I'm, I'm saying most people here are saved today. You know, 90% of people here will be saved. You know, but put your hand up, you know, if you're saved and you love Jesus. You know, put your hand up. You know, what the Bible says, you know, in, in John chapter 14, you know, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, and look down. And Ephesians chapter number five, it says, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a command of God, that we should be filled with the Spirit. Now, being filled, you know, because you say, you know, maybe you're, you're wondering, you know, how can you be filled with the Spirit? I've already received the Spirit when I got saved. You know, you do. You get the relic of the Holy Spirit when you get saved. But the moment you believe on Christ for salvation, yeah. you know, that you receive the Holy Spirit and dwell in you. But here he's talking about being filled with the Spirit. It's like in the Old Testament when they, you know, the prophets, you know, and, and Samuel and Saul and, and David and Elijah, you know, when they wanted to preach a good sermon or they go out to war, you know, they were, the Spirit of God was resting upon them. Now, turn to John, chapter number 7. John, chapter number 7. Because I've heard a lot of preachers and they'll say, you know, the day of Pentecost. You know, that's when, you know, they received the Holy Ghost. You know, that's when it was indwelling in them on the day of Pentecost. Now, I don't believe that because have a look in John chapter number 7. Have a look at verse number 13. John chapter number 7, verse number 38. It says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his valley shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Because they did not have the, you know, dwelling of the Holy Spirit as we do, you know, now in the Old Testament. And this is before Jesus died, so it's still the Old Testament. Now, if you turn to John chapter number 20, John chapter number 20, but here he says, you know, you'll receive the Spirit, you know, when I'm glorified, you know, when I'm risen from the dead. Have a look in John chapter number 20. John chapter number 20. Have a look at verse number 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. 
as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So I believe here, this is when they received the Holy Ghost. As in, you know, it's in well in them now. You know, they received the Holy Ghost. Just turn over probably one page in the Bible to the Acts chapter number 1. Because we see here on the day of Pentecost, you know, where some preachers, they'll say, you know, this is when they received the Holy Ghost and dwelling in them on the day of Pentecost. But that's not true. Have a look at verse number 8 of Acts chapter 1. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So here he says that the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. Now in chapter number 2 on the day of Pentecost, have a look at verse number verse number 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here we see that they're filled with the Spirit. And, you know, and that was the command in Ephesians chapter 5 that we need to be filled with the Spirit. And if we love God, if we love Jesus, you know, we want to keep His commandments. So we want to be, be filled with the Spirit because that's the command of God. Now, if you will turn to Hebrews chapter number 1. Hebrews chapter number 1. So if you can be filled with the Spirit, that means you can be empty of the Holy Spirit as well. And I'm not talking about, you know, dwelling with the Holy Spirit. You know, you're going to have that. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit, I promise. You know, until, you know, until the day you're going to have the Holy Spirit, wouldn't you? You know, that's his dwelling in you. But you can also, you know, lose the Holy Spirit, you know, the power of God on your life. And you have to be filled with the Spirit all the time. Now, have a look at Hebrews chapter number 1. Now, this is a great verse in verse number 9. It says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So here, you know, because you're going to, you know, how do I get filled with the Spirit? Well, you know, Ephesians chapter 5 says, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Yeah. You know, that's one way to be filled with the Spirit is singing hymns and songs and psalms. Yeah. You know, that's why we sing psalms and hymns, you know, in church service. You know, so we can be filled with the Spirit. Right. But here, look what, at Jesus. Because it says that he, God has anointed him with the oil of gladness above his fellows. And also, you're never going to be filled with the Spirit more than Jesus. You know, that's the, you know, you'll never reach it. But you could be filled with the Spirit, you know, above your fellows. You know, you could live, you know, you could be the greatest soul winner. You know, it could be a woman. You know, a woman in this church could be the greatest soul winner this church has ever seen. You know, it's like you. But here he says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even my God, have anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now the oil of gladness, you know, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. You know, if you look through the Bible, the oil, you know, is talking about it as symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Now here, it says, therefore. That means because, you know, because of something, you know, God has anointed them with the oil of gladness. And it says here in verse number 9 at the start, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, have anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That's why he was anointed with the oil of gladness, because he hated iniquity. He hated, it's quoted in Psalms, hated in wickedness. They say, and he's loved righteousness. So that's what you're going to have to do in your life. You're going to have to hate sin. You're going to have to hate, you know, abortion and murder and rape and, you know, every sin you can think of. You know, you're going to have to hate it all. But also, on the flip side, you're also going to have to love righteousness. You're going to have to love, you know, because you can't, there's people out there that, you know, that's all they do is just hate. You know, they hate homos, you know, great. You know, we hate homos. But you can't just hate homos. You know, you have to go soul and great. Right. You have to love righteousness. Right. Right. You have to go out into the lost and preach the gospel to every creature. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's what we have to do. We have to have both sides, you know, both sides of the coin. Yeah, we have to preach the gospel. We have to hate homos. You know, we have to, you know, love righteousness and hate iniquity. Yeah, you know, we have to, yeah, right. You know, we have to go to church. You know, love going to church. We have to love our wife. We have to do, you know, love everything that's right and hate everything that's wrong. You know, there's so much things that's wrong. You know, covetousness. You know, that's a major sin today that, you know, we don't hear that much about. But, you know, the Bible actually says, you know, has anyone told you that's a serious sin lately? Because you actually mean to get kicked out of the church if you're a covetous person. That's right. You know, when, if you're committed fornication, you get kicked out as well. But, you know, you've got three options probably. You know, you can either, you know, split up and keep going to church. You could, you know... 
Uh, sorry. Um, you can split up. You can leave your church, or you can get married. Okay, you got three options. But if you're covetous, you got two. You can get kicked out, or you can stop being covetous. No, but you know, and that's a lot of people. A lot of people. That's all they think about is just you know, their cars and their boats and their you know. Their, yeah, that's not even woman. I mean, the men. Sorry. And then the women are like you know, kettles and you know all the cooking appliances. You know, that's what they like. You know, everything's in the kitchen. You know, all the stuff in the kitchen. That's what you know. Man, I wish I could have this new you know popcorn maker and you know all these. Things. But you know. Covetous is a major sin, and we have to love righteousness and hate iniquity. You know, that's how we're going to be filled with the Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time, and thank you that we have the opportunity to preach. Please um, help us all to be filled with the Spirit, Lord, and, and please bless our uh, pastor Burson's sermon in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's turn to Psalm 364. We're going to sing one stanza. Song number 364. Song number 364. Standing on the promises. See it out on the first. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in my highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Bible say. That's what I want to hear. 
And as I was preparing for my sermon today, and, and uh, I was thinking about, you know, red hot. What is, what's going to be a hot topic? What's a hot sermon to preach? And I thought, well, what's the, one of the hardest sermons I think Jesus ever preached? And we find that here in Matthew 23. So if you look look down in your Bibles here in Matthew chapter 23, we're going to look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Then spake Jesus to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. And greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for what is your master, even Christ? And all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for what is your father which is in heaven? Neither be ye called masters, for what is your master, even Christ? But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind. For whether is greater the gold, or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. And have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall be scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, 
that you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to meet in your house this afternoon, dear God. Lord, it's, it's such a blessing that so many people are here today, dear God. There's so many people in this room that I truly believe love you, that want to hear the truth preached, dear God. I pray that you would please bless every individual here, dear Lord. I pray that you would please use me as your servant to deliver this message today, dear God. Fill me with your spirit and your power, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just help us all to learn and to grow closer to you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So we see here in Matthew 23, Jesus Christ is railing on the Pharisees. And, you know, the way that I read that, I think is very similar to the way that Jesus was probably preaching. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, why do you have to yell when you preach? Why, why can't you just sit down and have a soft voice? Well, I don't know if you noticed, but in this chapter, there's a lot of exclamation marks yeah, right. at the end of the verses. And, you know, an exclamation mark is not a period. That's not Jesus talking with a soft voice. He's saying, woe unto you, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Amen. He's letting them rip. He's letting them know where they stand. He's saying, you guys, you look all great. You look all beautiful on the outside. You look so holy. You're wearing your fancy robes. You go down to the market and everybody's praising you. And you love that. He says, you're full of dead men's bones. You look great on the outside, but the inside, you're full of wickedness and hypocrisy. And the subject more of, of, the, of the sermon this afternoon is don't be a Pharisee. Amen. Now I know Pastor Jimenez should be, uh, should be happy about this. I know you're very good about preaching sermons where you have uh, you know, the three points starting with the same letter. And I don't know if I've ever done this in a sermon before, but I thought it would be appropriate to, to, this afternoon to have one. So the first point about the Pharisees that they... Um, <clears throat> that made them real wicked is the things that they were doing, they were doing to be seen of men. Look down at verse number 5 there in Matthew 23. The Bible reads, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men Rabbi, Rabbi. Keep your finger in Matthew 23. Flip back to Matthew chapter 6. So what we see here is the wrong motivation for doing the right thing. What they cared more about was how they looked in the eyes of men. That's what the Pharisees cared about. They didn't care about, well... What do we have to do that's right so that God will be pleased with us? They only cared about, well, what, what can I say and what can I do where I can still just receive all these accolades where people can just love me and give me the best seats when I go out to the market, everyone knows my name, and that's what they cared about. And that's wicked. Now look, I don't think that we have a room full of Pharisees today. You know, the Pharisees were false teachers and false prophets, and many of them were just reprobate and beyond salvation. Okay, But as Christians, we need to make sure we don't fall into the same trap that we can beware of the leaven of the Pharisees so that it doesn't cleave to us. Right. Now, one thing that's great about this movement that we're a part of is the excitement and how many people from all over the place are getting involved Amen. and, Amen. and getting, getting motivated and going out and doing sewing and doing the work for God. But at no time do you ever want to get to a point where you let these things go to your head. Yeah. Right? With social media, with you know, with other outlets, you can have a lot of people just start praising, oh man, you know, great job. Hey, you know, congratulate people, encourage one another, edify one another. That's great. But always, always, always keep in mind who you're serving. Yeah. You're not serving yourself, right. you're not serving your friends, you're serving the Lord. That's yeah. right. Right. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse number 2. The Bible reads, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may glory, have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. 
Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. And then jump down to verse number 16. By reading, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. These are all attributes of the hypocrites, of the Pharisees. And we want to make sure that we are not her, uh, hypocrites. The only, they only do the things that they do to be seen of men. But that's not who they really are. They don't care about the good works. They don't care about the people they're helping. You know, even when they give alms. What's giving alms? Giving alms is giving money to people who are not fortunate. Someone who's maybe homeless or someone who's crippled. And, and they're giving money to try to help them out. When they give money, they're not giving money to help those people out. They're giving money because they're looking around and seeing who's going to see me reach in my pocket and give this person some money so they can think better of me and praise me for all the good I'm doing. Right. You know, in the world, we see this all the time. All these anthropological you know, uh, societies like the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation, yeah, on, right? These, these big foundations that they say, oh, look at how nice we are. We love people. We want to help people out. As they go and, you know, promote their vaccines and their death and the needle to, to the people in Africa or the, you know, and I didn't even realize this, but the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they also were the, the, the big promoters behind the Common Core. How well is that working out? That Common Core education in school? Yeah, I think that's going great, huh? In the, in the dumbing down of our children. But no matter what they do, whether they do things like that are wicked, like they're already involved in, or the things that might actually be a benefit to people, the only reason they do it at all is so that people can look at them and say, wow, you're such a nice guy, Bill Gates. Oh, wow, you know, I knew you were smart and a billionaire, but you're really nice, too. You're helping people out. And that's what they care about. But they don't care about the people, which is evidenced by the things that they do anyways. They don't care about them one bit. They're hypocrites. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We are going to eventually get back to Matthew 23. I know you keep your finger there, but uh, keep a bookmark or something there. We won't be back to that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> we need to watch out for the trap of, of receiving praise of men. Because honestly, you know, it start off real simple. You know, you just got a right heart, you got a right attitude, you go out, you want to serve God, you want to do something big for God. And praise the Lord, that's great, we want everybody doing that. But what can go along with that, that is a lot of people coming and, and shaking your hand and taking pictures with you and doing all these things and, and signing autographs, and before you know it, it might get to your head. And you've got to be careful about that and watch out for that because you don't want to be so comfortable receiving all this great accolades that now all of a sudden that's what you care about. You know, as, as, as the movement begins to grow and as, and as there's great leaders that are doing a great, wonderful work for Jesus Christ, always keep in mind who deserves and who ought to be getting the glory every single day. You know, I praise God for this conference. Glory to God for this conference. Glory to God for all the people that are here today and for all the preachers that have come to stand up and do something for the Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 27. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27, the Bible reads, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. 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 I stand up here, and you know, many of you are meeting me for the first time, and a lot of people don't know much about me. I'm a computer programmer. I am by nature very introverted. I was a nerd, okay? I was a person that liked to keep to himself. I still am a nerd. I say that I was a nerd, and I still am a nerd. But uh, the only reason I can even stand up here today and not buckle over in my gut is by the power of God. He gets all the credit for you. Know, he, he glories. He gets everything, all the credit for, for changing my life, for helping to change my life, to actually stand up and to do something for him. He gets all the glory. You know, whatever, whatever I feel like I could bring to the table, I'm going to do it for God. But he's the one that gets all the credit. And I think it's important that you understand a little bit about where I came from. Because 
to see the change that happens. You may be sitting there thinking today, there's no way I could ever stand up and run a group of people and say anything. There's no way I could ever go out and knock on a door because, I mean, that's just weird. What's the person going to say? What if they slam the door? I mean, you know, and you have all these worries and concerns. I can't do that. Yes, you can. God can do all things. He can give you the power. You need to rest. And it, now look, it's not easy. You have to be able to overcome some obstacles in your life. You may have to, to get over yourself. Yeah. I know I sure did. Yeah. Come on, good. But if you can just go to God with the right attitude, with the right spirit, say, God, I can see this is evident in the Bible. That's exactly the path that I took. I started attending church. And, and just seeing, I mean, verse after verse, everything stands out to me. The preaching's there saying, we need to be going out preaching the gospel to every creature. It's there. It's obvious. And if you're not a soul winner today, you know, don't lie to yourself about this. It's there. This job is for everybody. Now, how many people were there this morning going out soul winning? 195. Praise the Lord. 195 people. But I know we've got more than 195 people in here right now. Okay, now, I understand completely what it feels like to have never gone and given gospel before. I know what it's like to have the fear. But I'll tell you what, the fear is not of God. The Bible tells us the only person that we're supposed to be afraid of is God. Amen. That's it. We, we, we shouldn't fear what man can do unto us, but what God can do. Now, I love all of the excitement surrounding all of the soul winning marathon. I love that people are going out soul winning, getting people saved. And I'm not against that language at all, by the way. Of, you know, we say, you know, I got this many people saved. I saved nine people a day, seven people a day, whatever it is. You know, praise God for that. But I thought that, uh, you know, Brother Stucky yesterday before when I was soul winning preached a really great message on, uh, on making sure that we don't get so caught up in the numbers. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of paraphrasing what he said, but, but getting caught up in, in saying, you know, and, and getting the, the, the zeal of everyone else, like, oh man, this person, you know, you get in competition with each other, yeah. and you start giving, you know, being a little bit more relaxed about how you're giving the gospel just so you get somebody to pray with you, right. yeah. instead of actually getting them saved. Amen. Right. Yeah. Right. And that is hypocritical, and this is exactly what I'm preaching about, you got to watch out for. Yeah. Because when you go out soul winning, you know you ought to care about? The person you're giving the gospel to. That's what you need to be concerned about. Don't worry about how many numbers that you can get. And you can go back to your friends and say, oh, I got 10 people saved today. Right, come on. You know what? If you get 10 people saved, praise the Lord for that. But you don't need to be going around boasting about that either. You want to encourage other people with, with, with the fact that a lot of people got saved? Amen and amen. Amen. But don't let it go to your head. Turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> the Bible actually addresses this, this topic, this point exactly here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse <clears throat> number 12, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. They're giving themselves commendation. They say, don't be like those people that want to lift themselves up. <clears throat> but they, measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. So when you go around just comparing yourself to other people, they well, I'm doing this, and you're doing that, you're not wise. Yeah, that's, right. that's not a wise thing to do at all. Let's keep reading our verse number 13. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God has distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far to, as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure that is of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorious, does this sound familiar? Let him glory in the Lord. Amen. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Amen. Amen. 
Don't need to worry about making yourself look good about how, how well of a job you're doing out there. The only one you need to worry about doing a good job for is the Lord. Amen. What he cares, what he sees, right. what he thinks about you, that's what we ought to care about. I'll read this for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Go back if you would to Matthew 23. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 says, But though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, saying, <clears throat> Even though I preach the gospel, he says, I have nothing to glory of. There's, there's nothing for me to glory of. He says, It's necessity. I need to go out and do this. This isn't my job. God's commanded me to go out and do this. He says, woe unto me if I don't go out and preach the gospel. And that's the proper attitude that we need to have today. Now I'm going to get to my second point. See, the, the first point that the Pharisees had, we don't want to be a Pharisee. The Pharisees did things to be seen of men. The second point here, look at verse number 2 of Matthew 23, is that the Pharisees, they say, but they do not. So the things they do do, they do to be seen of men. But besides that, they say things, but then they don't actually do them. Look at verse number 2. Saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So the things that, that the Pharisees were saying to do, Jesus is saying, you know what? A lot of what they're teaching is right from the Bible. A lot of things that are coming out of their mouth, he's saying, you know what? Go ahead and observe those things. Observe the law of Moses. Observe those commandments. He says, but don't, don't look at what they're doing, because they don't believe in it. If they believe Moses, they believe in me. You know, they believe in Jesus Christ. Yeah. They didn't believe any of that stuff, and they weren't doing it. And he says, you know what? Go ahead and observe the law. He says, but, but you need to actually do it. Now, the irony of calling people like, like Pastor Menez or Pastor Anderson or Pastor Merrill a Pharisee, because we've all heard it before. I've heard it, I don't know how many times, oh, they're, they're Pharisees, I can't believe you listen to that. You, you know, it, it's, the funny thing is, though, the, the irony is that they're the exact opposite. Because we see here, the Pharisees, they say, but they do not. And all the things that I've heard these other preachers, these men of God, come up and preach, I've seen every single one of them do exactly what they preach. And that is actually one of the biggest reasons that I ever even got plugged into church myself. I got, I've gone to visit in other churches, and you know, you can hear some kind of preaching from the pulpit, you hear a little bit there, and then you kind of get to know or see what's going on in the pastor's life, and it's like, do you even believe what you're saying? So many times I've seen it where it's just like, you're saying this, but then you go, you're preaching against the movies, and then you go into your van, and you've got the DVD coming up right on inside of the vehicle. Yeah. You know, what, like, you, you're, you're, you're preaching one way from the pulpit and, tell, and, and doing the exact opposite when you go in the privacy of your own home or in the privacy of your own minivan. <laughs> but what got me so plugged in is because it's real. Yeah. The preaching that you hear at Verity Baptist Church is real. Amen. And anybody who knows Pastor Menace knows that that's the truth. Yeah. He doesn't get up here and try to lay burdens on you that are grievous to be born. And tell you, you need to be going out and so on. You need to be putting all these hours. You need to be reading your Bible. You need to be praying. And he's not doing it. You better believe he's doing it. Yeah. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12 tells us to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And that's what hypocrisy is. It's, it's you say one thing and you do another thing. You don't stay true to your word. Bible says, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear and closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. This is a warning for those of you that want to be fake. Don't be a fake Christian. Don't, don't go around, you know, talking the talk and talking real big and then not doing any of the works, not doing the things or living up to your own words. So if you're not going to do anything, then don't do it. But don't go around saying that you are. Yeah, right. And the Bible's warning you here that, you know, all the things that you do in the darkness, the light's going to be shining on that. You know, be sure your sin will find you out. Just like Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. Remember, 
They thought they were getting away with, with selling their property and saying, oh, we're going to give all the money we get for our property is going right to the church to be seen as men, right? And you know what? There would have been nothing, nothing wrong with them doing that. A lot of people were, were bringing their property and laying it down on the apostles' feet. But what did they do? They lied about it. They, they kept back part of the price. They were covetous. They, they, they wanted to receive the praise of, of them actually giving everything, but they also wanted some of that money for themselves. And they held it back. And what happened to them? They lost their lives. They fell down and gave up the ghost. That's how God feels about being a hypocrite. Yeah. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, there's a lot, there's a lot of content in the Bible about the, the, Pharisa- the true Pharisaical attitude, not the, not the one that the people who don't even understand who the Pharisees were want to say. They want to say because you're preaching the law that you're a Pharisee. No. The Pharisees, they may have preached law, but they didn't believe it and they didn't do it. That's right. The things that we preach, we actually go out and do. Amen. <clears throat> Matthew 15, we start reading verse number 1, by the read, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die to death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by him. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandments of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites. Well, the desire to prophesy of you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain may you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. <clears throat> The Pharisees were the one that placed their own man-made rules above God's word. The vast majority of preachers today, they want to tell you that God doesn't care about, you know, what you wear and how you look, the way that you're dressed, in opposition to Deuteronomy 22.5. They tell you that, oh, you know, God doesn't care about, the, you know, the, the length of your hair. Why do you get so worried about that? Well, maybe because he dedicated half a chapter in 1 Corinthians 11 to... Uh, being ashamed for men to have long wear hair and, and for women it's, it's a glory unto them. <clears throat> or how women ought to be in subjection to their own husbands, which is found many places throughout the Bible, like Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, and, and many other places. See, the Pharisees ignored the clear teaching from Scripture and they made their own rules that they liked better. They didn't want to be held accountable in this passage to honoring their father and mother. With honoring their father and mother here, this is not just talking about respecting the things that they say, or treating them with respect. The respect is there, but they needed to actually take care of them. It is the duty of the children, when your parents get old, when, when, when they get to a point to where they need help and they need to be taken care of, it is the duty of the children to take care of your parents. Amen. And that is what is being taught here in, in Matthew about honoring your father and mother. Because what the Pharisees said, well, whatever you might be profited by, me, and, and you know, pay attention to that word, profited. You know, that's, that's how they're going to be helped financially. What's going to be done to their betterment? Whatever I do for you, you can just consider that a gift. That was their attitude. Anything that you get from me, just consider yourself lucky. And Jesus said, you made the commandment of God of none effect. Because the Ten Commandments tell you to honor your father and mother. God's law says that you know it's your job, it's your duty to take care of your parents. And you're saying, well, if you get anything from me, then you're lucky. That's wickedness. Now turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 18. We're at my last point here. <clears throat> Luke chapter 18. So the first thing the Pharisees did, they did things to be seen of men. They didn't care about what God thought. They cared about what people thought. <laughs> the other thing that they do is they say, but they do not. They say they believe the Bible. They say they believe in Moses' law, but they didn't do it. They didn't believe it. <clears throat> and the third thing that's an attribute of the Pharisees was that they were self-righteous. 
Look at Luke 18, verse number 9. Luke 18, verse 9 says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing far off would not lift up so much as his eyes in the heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And it's important, especially the more you grow in the Lord, the, 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 the more sin you get out of your life, the more righteous you start living, that you don't get this puffed up, self-righteous attitude about you, you know, this holier-than-thou mentality like this Pharisee that here where he's going and saying, you know what, God, I thank you that I'm not like this guy over here. I thank you that I'm not an adulterer. I thank you that, you know, I don't have any of these serious sins in my life, dear God. And, he, you know, he, he's vainly puffed up trying to make it sound to himself like he's humble as he's looking down his nose at someone else yeah. who actually needs help. And, you know, the guy that's just humble says, you know what, God, just forgive me. God, I, you know, <clears throat> be merciful unto me. I'm a sinner. That type of humility, never lose that humility. No matter where you get, no matter how elevated spiritually you may get, no matter, no matter how well the life you're leading. You know, Job was a great example of this. Job was the most righteous man upon the earth, but you know what? He was still very humble. He was still worried about, he said he was, he was daily, you know, providing sacrifices just for his own children. He said, I don't know what they might have done, God, but I want to try to make things right. And he was constantly, you know, he didn't get all self-righteous either. Even though he knew he wasn't in any major sin, he did not charge God foolishly with his lips. That's right. He didn't say, you know, you're wrong, God. He just, you know, he humbled himself and, and um, he, he might not have understood what was going on, but he, uh, he never charged God foolishly or thought of himself more than he actually was. <clears throat> Turn if you would to Matthew chapter 7. And one of the problems that goes along with being self-righteous is having an improper judgment. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to see what this, what this message really means. I'm not going to stop after the first two words. Matthew 7 verse 1 says, judge not, that you be not judged. You know, a lot of people want to say, see, the Bible says judge not. Oh, you can't judge anything because the Bible says judge not. So let's read what the whole passage is actually saying, Amen. shall we? Amen. We're, not, we're not two word uh, Christians here when, we go, when it comes to the Bible. Let's read this passage in context. Matthew 7 verse 1, judge not, that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the most? That is in thy brother's eye, but consider it's not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. And what this is teaching, obviously, that since we just read through it, is saying, you know, be careful of how you judge people. Because the way that you judge other people, the same standard is going to be held for yourself. So if you're going to judge someone on a particular sin, then just understand that that's the same judgment that you deserve too. Because you're on, you're on the same ground, you're in the same playing field, you're, you know, you're both people. And if you have a serious problem in your life, you got a serious sin. You know, you want to tell everyone else how to go sewing, how to do this other stuff, and you're not even going to church. You know, he's saying you have no standing and no place to be judging what other people are doing because you've got a big beam sticking out of your eye. Yeah. You're trying to help someone who's got a smaller sin in their life, you know, and, and you've got this big old stick coming out of your eye. I don't want someone like that trying to get involved in picking a little piece of speck out of my eyeball. When they go, here, brother, let me help you. And they've got a big old tree coming out of their eye. No, 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 you can't see anything. You're going to make it worse. That's what this passage is saying. But it's not saying 
don't ever judge anybody. It's not saying don't ever help to get that, that moat out of your brother's eye. He's saying, first, take care of yourself. First, get that big beam out of your eye. And look, if your brother's got a problem, if he's got you know something in his eye, once you what you can see clearly, go ahead and help him out. As I started off, you know, we want to know the areas where we're doing wrong. In. Now you don't want to hear it from someone who's who's got a big beam coming out of their eye. And it's not it's not going to be receivable anyways, and most likely they're going to be wrong. They're going to be incorrect in their judgment because they don't even understand that they've got some serious problems of their own. Now, for a long time, after I got saved, I was very worldly. I got saved when I was 20 years old. Before I got saved, I liked to go out and party and drink and drugs and all that other stuff. I'm not going to list all my sins for you, but I like to do all those things. And guess what? After I got saved, I still like to do those things. Well, how could that be? Maybe you didn't get saved. No, because I still have the flesh. When I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ... There's a new creature born that day. There's a new spirit born inside of me. Amen. amen. Praise God for that. But you know what didn't change was my flesh. Yeah. Right. Amen. That's why we got to fight the flesh every day. Amen. Now, what happened was I was real excited. I got saved. You know, I told my friends about it and they didn't know what I was talking about. And they kind of mocked me and they whatever. And I was excited. I was telling my family. But after a while, you know, I never ended up going to church. I was never really reading my Bible. I wasn't feeding my spirit at all. And that excitement faded pretty quick. Now I knew I was saved. I was born again. But the flesh is still there. And the flesh, I lived, I lived as a worldly Christian, as a worldly man for, for many years. I even had a friend that had a really bad accident during this time. He was a good friend of mine. He got in a car wreck. And it was, it was almost fatal. His head busted open, and his wife had to kneel on his head to keep his brains from coming out. Sorry for being a little graphic, but I mean, it was serious. He was helicoptered out. He ended up surviving and not having brain damage. Wow. And this is someone that I knew. But because I was living such a shame of a life, because I was living and drinking and doing all these other things, I didn't really want to talk about Jesus with them. And here is an opportunity that I had in my life of a friend that got to a point where, man, you know, I, I can't believe I actually got out of this okay and was seeking God. Huge impact. So he finally came to me and said, you know what? I'm going to the Mormon church. I was not going to the Mormon church. And the reason why he wanted to go there, he said, is because there's something different about them. Yeah. He saw the exterior, right? Just like the Pharisees, you know, they had the outside clean. He saw, he's like, well, they're real family-oriented, you know. They don't even drink, you know, Coca-Cola because of the caffeine. So he's thinking, like, hey, they're, they actually are zealous and believe in something. You know, because he sees all these other phony Christians out there saying, well, you know, what makes you any different? And that's why he chose them. And unfortunately, it's a shame for me that I wasn't living a righteous life. Because if I was living right, for one, I wouldn't have been ashamed to even talk about Christ. Because the reason why, and here's the thing, you know, I tried to tell him a little bit because it just, when it was right up in my face, you know, I tried to explain that to him. That no, no, don't get involved with the Mormons, you know, they're cults and everything else. But I hadn't talked to him about Christ ever before that. And the reason why is because I didn't want to be a hypocrite. So I chose, you know, when, when God says, you know, get cold or get hot, I was cold. And I, I wasn't lukewarm. I was cold. But but that was a shame. And we don't want to be hypocrites. I didn't want to be a hypocrite. But what a waste. I mean, this guy, I don't I mean, I, I don't think he ever got saved. You know, I, I tried to get in contact with him much later after I got in, in church and stuff, but he's real hard to find. I never got an opportunity to talk to him again. And you know, sometimes there's opportunities in our life that are just gonna be gone. Right, and we don't want to be hypocrites. So <clears throat> in order to not be a hypocrite and do the right thing, is you need to get right with God. You need to get the mode out of your you know, the beam out of your own eye. You need to get the sin out of your life. So that you don't have to be ashamed to talk about Christ. You don't have to worry about being a hypocrite. That's right. And that time of my life, it actually got so bad that I even began to doubt my own salvation. 
Because I would think to myself, how can I claim to believe the Bible? Say, you know what, I believe that is the Word of God. And I did believe that. And I was saved. But I would tell myself after years and years, how can I say that I believe this book? And I go off and do these things that I know aren't right. I'm going off and, and, and you know, getting drunk. And the Bible is very, very clear that that's a sin. And that's wickedness. And I would do these things from day and, and question, how can I do these things? And it wasn't, I'll be honest with you, it wasn't really until I got plugged into a good church and I started hearing the hard preaching to where the changes actually happened in my life. You know, I, I, I quit drinking before I went to church, but that's a whole other story. There was another reason for that, and that was the chastisement of God in my life. The hard preaching is important. We need to hear from God's Word Thus saith the Lord. It needs to be thundered out. It needs, you, know, you can't just tiptoe around it. You need, you know, the kids need to hear, you know, don't drink booze and alcohol because it'll destroy your life. Amen. It'll either destroy your life or destroy yeah. someone else's life. Right. Right. Don't even look upon the wine when it's red. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. Amen. And there's so many more lessons like that that we need to learn. And it needs to be thundered out. And praise God for the people that aren't afraid to speak them. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 2. I'm almost done here. Romans chapter 2. Have the right heart this morning. Don't do things to be seen of men. <clears throat> don't say you're going to do things and let you do do things and not do them. And don't get puffed up in your own self-righteousness. Keep that humility. You know, it's important for me to remember how I was and to remember that I'm not where I ought to be yet. Because there's still a long way to go. With Jesus Christ as the perfect example, I'm really far from that. Keep yourself humble. Romans chapter 2, we're going to see one more section here about, about judging. One more <clears throat> response to the, the bony Christians that want to use this in, a, in an inappropriate way. Romans chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible reads, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same thing. Now, if you're not familiar about the reprobate doctrine that we believe, you know, it's found in Romans chapter 1 the most clearly, as well as in many other places in the Bible. But when, all, when everything, act, you know, when, when the, the world gets their attention focused on, why do you hate this time? Like, why do you hate these people? You know, how could you judge people like that? Just like they did in Lot's day. When they said, oh, who, you, know, you came to sojourn among us and now you're going to be a judge over us? When Lot told the filthy sodomites not to do something so wicked as to go and, and take these men that just came into the city and to defile them with their perversion. And they're like, oh yeah, don't judge us. How dare you judge us? And people will look at this list and they'll say, well, you've done you know, one of, or two of these things in Romans chapter 1. And say, you know what? No, it's not saying that the sodomites do one of these things. It's not saying that the sodomites are, you know, maybe they have some deceit. It's saying that they do all of those things. Those are all attributes of the Sodomite. And the reason why you can judge is if you are not a Sodomite, you are not judging and doing the same thing that they do. So in Romans chapter 2, you know, people say, oh, you read Romans 1, why don't you read Romans 2? Yeah, we are looking at Romans chapter 2, and it says, Thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judges doest the same thing. Now, if you're a sodomite, don't go judge the sodomites. But I'm not a reprobate, I'm not a sodomite, so I'm going to judge them. Because I'm not doing the same things that they're doing. And it fits perfectly with Matthew 7, which says the same thing. You know, if you're the, the way that you judge others, it's going to come back on you. But if you're, you know, if you're not involved, if you're not guilty of that, then why can't you judge? Let's keep reading here, verse number 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth, against them which commit such things. Say, look, for one, this is the judgment of God. When we read Romans chapter 1, that's the judgment of God. And we know that God's word is true 
and that this is according to truth against them that commit such things. God's judgment is on them. Verse number three, we're, we're, we're just repeating it and letting other people know, hey, God's judgment is upon these people. Right. Verse number three, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them <clears throat> which do such things and do us the same. You notice the theme here? He's, he's talking about hypocrites, talking about people who are judging, but they're doing the exact same thing. That thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Jump down to verse number 17. I'm going to close with this. Romans 2, verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of, the, of God. And knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth and the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. The rebuke was coming on these people who thought they were teachers. They thought that they were preaching the word of God and they thought that they were instructors of the blind. And he's saying, okay, you know, you teach that you shouldn't steal. Are you stealing? You teach that you don't, you shouldn't commit adultery. Are you committing adultery? And the Pharisees were full of wickedness. Right. They were full of this sin. And he said, you're standing up there doing this. And this is why the name of God is blasphemed among the unbelievers, among the Gentiles. It's because of your poor witness and your poor testimony and you being a hypocrite. The hypocritical teachers are why I didn't get plugged into church earlier. The hypocritical teachers is why so many people reject Christianity overall. Because you see these people, they say one thing and they don't do it. Right. Don't ruin your testimony by being a hypocrite. As a Christian, there's always going to be people watching you. There's always going to be someone looking at you. Especially the people that hate God. They're going to be ready to pounce on you any moment. You slip up a little bit, they're going to be right there to, to, to be all over you. But it's not just them. You know, when you come to church, there's oftentimes there may be children that look up to you. You don't even realize it. You're, you're their favorite person in church. you got other church members that maybe they're a little bit newer in Christ. And they look to you because for whatever reason, they get along with you. They, you know, they like you. Look, there's always people, don't ever think that, you know, when you start getting involved in sin, tell that you're only affecting yourself. Because you're not. And if you're one of these Christians that's willing to say, I believe the Bible, I believe that these things are sin, then you know what? Believe it and do it. Don't be a hypocrite. Because you're, you're not only going to ruin yourself, you're going to ruin someone else that's watching. You're going to ruin someone else who's looking up to you. We need to be people of our word. We ought to have the right attitude. We don't need to be doing things to be seen of others. And it doesn't matter. It's not what matters. What matters is what's in God's eyes. We shouldn't be saying things that we're doing and not doing them. And we ought not to be self-righteous. As far as that word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to, have, to preach tonight, this, this afternoon, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us all to have the right motivating factors in our life to serve you, dear Lord, with all of our hearts. And that we would truly live to a standard that you have for us. Not what other men have, have made standards of, dear God, but that you have for us in our life. Help us to, uh, to be honest in our service to you, dear Lord. <clears throat> and help us to, to be humble in, in our service with you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. That's a wonderful uh, challenge. I think that was something we needed. You know, it's, we need to be really careful in these these types of churches. I'm talking about parity. I'm talking about our types of churches. There's a 
we want to be, we want to encourage people. We want people to be encouraged. We want people to know that hey, things are happening and people are getting saved and, and those are all good things. But there's a, there's a very thin line between you know encouraging and commending yourself. And you know we want to be careful with that. You know we want to be careful with Facebook. And I'm not, but I'm not mad at you if you're on Facebook. Right? I think that's fine. I think there's good things, good uses for Facebook. Our church is on Facebook. Be careful if your Facebook page doesn't become, just become, you know, commend myself page. Where I'm just, you know, showing everybody how great I am and how spiritual I am. And sometimes it's okay, and let me just understand, but sometimes it's okay to do something spiritual and have nobody know about it. And uh, that's, that's good. And, and we want to keep track of numbers. We want to rejoice in that. We want to put that in the rules. And we don't, don't misunderstand that. I don't think that's what Pastor Bruce was saying, but I'm going to be very careful not to become uh, fixated on what people think about us. And here's the thing. The Pastor Anderson will tell you the same thing. You, you can, you can uh, sit there and put up a facade and a show all you want. But you know what? When the rubber hits the road, we're going to find out who you really are. That's right. And when the protesters show up, when the media shows up, I, I, I'm amazed in our church, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm not kind of pointing at God. I'm, I'm amazed in our church. There's some people that I, honestly, I was just kind of like, man, you know, I wonder, wonder about so and so. Are they going to stick around? And, you know, the, the, the protest came, and, and they just got on fire, you know? They just got revived. And they, you know, they showed me who they really are. There's other people, I was surprised, you know, they ran. And uh, judge up, they show you who they really are. So make sure that you are on the outside if you say you are on the inside. We're going to have Brother uh, Al come up and lead us in a song, and we're going to prepare for baptism. So if you're being baptized, make sure you get up and head back there and get ready. And then don't forget at five, we've got the different activities, and we've got to meet with the uh, Washington people. Well, I'm going to. Amen. This is a song number 328. Song number 32.